Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. Hosted by Stuart Armstrong, an experienced talent development specialist and coach, the Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. Always honest, sometimes controversial, never dull. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better, faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Good morning, Talent Tribe. Um, it's a uh, bright, sunny morning over here in the, in the UK. And um, uh, I've got a, a bit of a, I guess, a blast from the past in terms of my, uh, my time working in the, in the world of golf and junior golf development and talent. Um, I've got uh, Stuart Morgan on the podcast. Stuart, welcome. Thank you, Stu. Thanks for having me on. Uh, great, great to have you on. Um, so uh, we go back quite a long way, I think. It, I, de- I don't really want to think about how long it is, but That's um, probably best we, did, too. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did quite a bit of work together in the uh, in the England Golf Junior Talent Pathway uh, back in the day within the regional program and various things like that. Uh, but you've obviously been gallivanting all around the world. So um, why don't you tell everybody about your uh, your journey? Yeah. So after that. Um... You know, a lot has kind of happened. Uh, I I went down a lot of the the junior side of things. It kind of really interests me in the seeing, you know, certain kind of tech. You know, people working excessively with technique and and whatnot. Even myself, and just not, I wasn't really seeing the improvements with the players that I was working with to what I felt should be happening. You know, and. I'm a kind of an inquisitive person and I'm a kind of a reader as well. So I just, I went on this journey, met Graham McDowell, who kind of opened my eyes to some of the training elements um, and then really kind of delved heavily into it. That took me to, to the U S and I worked at a big junior golf Academy over there. And, you know, we integrated some differences with uh, some changes into the program over there and how the juniors actually train in line with their goals. Um, And while I was over there, uh, I had the, I was got hooked up with, you know, game like training, uh, Matthew Cook there and Cordy. And I went to speak to uh, Dr. Anders Ericsson, Dr. Robert Bjork, Dr. Fran Pirazzolo, Dr. Paul Shemp. Um, Just because I was just interested in, in how people really cha- train and improve and, and what we're kind of what I feel golf is kind of missing out on a lot. And now I'm back in Europe. I'm based in Austria at Writers Golf and Country Club in the heart of Burgenland. And uh yeah, just willing to kind of, well, just wanting to get back in and, and seeing where we are in Europe as well and, and seeing if we can kind of improve how, what things are happening and uh, and how people are actually training in the world of golf from junior level who are maybe wanting to go and play collegiate golf in the US, go and play professional golf and also the professional players because I still think that uh, we can improve them as well with how they train. So um, a, a rich a rich history over the years. Um, yeah. Tell me about the. Tell me about your time over with the um, with the academy over in in the states. What did you learn from that experience? I learned. I think the the biggest thing I learned from there was the how many different cultures. I, you know, I think it made me a better coach and and tried to understand the you know some of the psychosocial elements of golf and and the individual that you're dealing with because you know when we when I got there, you know, we had 80 students and from all over the world. And then we had eight coaches. So, you know, when you have it, it, the challenge was really putting the, the kind of the groups and the training together. So yes, the students would 
be with like-minded individuals in the group. Then you've got to put the cultural mix in there is are they going to, you know, enjoy what they're doing? Are some just wanting to get on with things on their own? Um, how do they train? Like, because in, again, different cultures, different parts of the world, they have different visions of what, how golf should be practiced. So it's just kind of integrating that. And we kind of got to a point in year. So year one was very much a, a an overview for me, looking at what was kind of happening and how we could kind of softly change some things over there. Year two, we actually, you know, got flying. Ian Highfield came on board. Um, so he kind of helped a lot with the training aspect as well, because we see things very much the same way. Got the coaching team that we kind of wanted and really made it much more about golf course in the training. Um, because I, you know, I figured out and, and also speaking to Dr. Richard Bailey a long time ago of, well, if we need to understand what the problem is first before we can start to integrate any sort of technical skills to to play. Whereas I think when I first went over there, it was very much the other 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 way. So it was like, okay, we need to change this technique because it maybe it doesn't look right or you know whatever it was, and it it just seemed it didn't connect for me. The, the students were not motivated because they didn't understand where it was going to take them. And I do think there's still a lot of that that kind of goes on. So we, so how do you, yeah, how do you, um, just talking about that then, what was the, <clears throat> what was the shift and kind of one of the things I know that my listeners are always interested in is, is like how coaches actually do things. So you say, you talked about, you know, it's, it's become more about the course. So I'm assuming the, your predominant learning environment became the golf course and you sort of work backwards from there based on, the problems that the players were trying to solve. So just explain a bit more about kind of what you might do in that scenario. Yeah. So when I, um, when we, when I first went over there and I looked at the program, they were, I think they were on the practice area or a short game or putting maybe 75% of their time. Mm -hmm. And which I just thought, like, how how is this, you know, I I didn't understand it because, because I look, you know, I've asked, you know, a lot of, high level players and every one of them said to me yeah, I played more when I was younger than I ever practiced than I was ever on the practice driving range so we kind of changed that and within the structure the best we could ever get to was 50 50 um so so what we basically did all of a sudden the students were playing way more than than what they were to start with. And that started to bring up a whole different level of things. And then I started to add some um, some constraints into them, just some kind of games and some fun things that I've done in the past just to try and get them to experience, first of all, before we could then start to tailor it to the individual. And what I found was is when you added some of these kind of levels of constraints in and you made – the tasks challenging and one you know one day we made a task which was almost impossible to deal with and we explained that it's about you know resilience it's about the ability to keep going um when things are challenging and 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 whatnot because that's kind of what golf is and then we made some different challenges like birdie challenges from front tees if you made a birdie you move back if you made a double the birdies wipe and you move back to the front tees and all of a sudden i started to see this this switch going on it wasn't just about going out onto the golf course pl- and playing it actually became more engaging for them and then when we started to kind of get you know get them interested in that we could then also look at them as an individual because then you already had the buy in because they you know they love doing it yeah um, you know, that that was the big thing that's that's one of the big things i think about this approach for me is that um is that not only does it really enhance skillfulness or skills, yeah. but also it's absorbing. And in terms of motivation, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, people don't have the motivation to practice. Well, when you're essentially, you know, training in this way or practicing in this way through play, you know, there's no problem with uh, motivation. If anything, there's the opposite problem of trying to get them focused on some of the other things they might have to do, like schoolwork and various other bits. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And when, we, when I kind of transitioned then towards the end of my, my time there, you know, I'm always kind of like trying to test myself to how 
how much of it has actually gone in with for the student because you know there's no point if they don't understand it or they don't know how to do it themselves then in some you know some instances it's kind of pointless and we we did this whole thing where we kind of sat them down and they had to kind of do some homework for us and uh, come up with their own training tasks and and things like that and there was a very much a mix of some golf course some um some putting green and, and things like that but the fact the, the big thing for me is that they knew how to do it and they were actually toward the end they would rather go and play and do these things or kind of come up with some kind of game um connected to what they needed to do rather than actually just go and beat balls on the driving range and that was that to me was like okay great you know, I can. I felt like I could kind of go away from there and walk away from there, knowing that there's some of these students are going to go off to college and and whatnot, and 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 I feel kind of much more com- confident in myself that if they choose to, they have some skills that they can develop this themselves and they can do it themselves. They're, they're lucky, I suppose, in that context because you, as a group of coaches, I mean, you've you've got a. I'm assuming you've got sort of the course available to you at certain times where you're able then to um, structure this training and potentially even be with them in the training, in, in the kind of playing environment, which very few kids, certainly in golf, from my experience, ever get that opportunity because their coach is busy doing, you know, whatever they do, you know, running a club or doing lessons for other people. They very rarely get to see them in a competitive environment. Yeah, I agree. And I, I always say that, you know, we were lucky in that environment. Um, but I always say that, and I think I've said it on on multiple occasions that if you're a, a young golfer and you have your golf coach, then you know invest in and and demand that 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 coach comes out on the golf course with you or comes to a tournament because it's it kind of cuts down. It's like a, a how do they call it like false economics in some ways because. You know they'll take huge amounts of kind of golf lessons, but actually they could they could if they you know if the social economic standpoint is a struggle for them, they could also take a percentage of that and say, okay, at the start of the year or whatever time in the year, I'm going to pay for my coach to come and watch me play in a tournament, and it can be kind of local or or close to where they are, could be even just a club tournament, but just to come out and watch and see what's going on because then the coach is going to have a much broader idea of actually what's going on and then the 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 coaching that can then be developed in the program and the development can then be tailored around what they see on the golf course and if they do that at certain times a year for me it's amazing what the improvement can happen and how um you get into this kind of cycle of of development which is um which is hugely important yeah, I think there's um that that I mean that's a really that's a really key thing and and I think there's a um I think there's a there's a really good lesson there for anybody out there you know any kind of parents or or kids who are out there and they're kind of looking around for a coach I think if if the coach doesn't sort of almost at the first standpoint you know make reference to the fact that you know I'm going to watch you in composition or I'm going to watch you play um, as a starting point then I would really question what they what they were doing because ultimately that has to be how they how they guide the learning journey for that individual without seeing what their strengths weakness is what what they can do and all those sorts of things they're really not going to be helping that individual develop based on what they need and what and what they what they want yeah absolutely because you de- you definitely find as the human element of you know it you know works both ways it works from the coach's side you know the coach may like doing you know coaching one element of the game more than another and then a player also will as it gravitates towards their own equilibrium of saying okay i want to i want to practice this because i want to have a lesson in this because i like doing this or i'm good at it whereas when you see it as a broader perspective and you watch them in in the environment that they're actually being judged on then all of a sudden you can't get away from the fact of you know what you see it you know from the coach and and the player standpoint and the great thing is it opens up like you said learning opportunities it opens up a, 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 to be able to you know discuss sit down reflect have different conversations 
you know, ask them, okay, in this situation, what were you doing? What were you thinking? What was your strategy? You know, so it's not just about being able to hit the golf ball. It's, you know, it's, it starts with, it's, it's everything. It's everything put together. And that's where I think training and, and practice and definitely is evolving, but needs to evolve more into. Well, actually, that's a nice segue, actually, onto um, um, a bit of insight into this. So I was, I was the other day listening to, um, you mentioned at the start of this, this podcast, um, the podcast that Cordy Walker does um, called Game Light Training. This is his second one. There's a, the, he's, got a, he's got another one out as well, which is um, uh, Golf Science Lab, both of which are fantastic uh, and I would highly recommend them but um you're on uh you're on the uh the latest one I've been listening to and I've only listened to um to episode one because I know it's a two-parter but you you actually have a parent and a young player on the podcast talking about their kind of developmental journeys and I think massively illuminating um both in terms of the relationship you clearly have with those those sort of you know those two individuals, the relationship you have with the player, the relationship you have with the parent, and the genuine genuine trust and bond that's been forged there, and how that's massively uh, turbocharged her, her abilities. Uh, so anybody anybody listening to this definitely go over there and listen to that. But I wonder if you could just you know from you you know from your perspective just tell us a bit more about that story, that journey. Yeah, I mean it was really interesting because, and it's only till recently, you know, you have these these moments of um, like wow moments kind of when you, when you're reading something, I, I spoke to uh, Dr. Sophia Jowett at Loughborough about connection. And, yeah. um, and when I look back then from chatting to her and, and, and also uh, reflecting on my own time with the players who I've worked with, who I felt have kind of, you know, gone on to, you know, to do well. I definitely had, there's definitely a connection there between all three components. So it's myself, the player, and the parent. And wh- where I look back at this is that I, I struck up this connection with Kelvin um, straight away. Um, Emily was eight at the time when we first started working, but we were kind of a similar age and, um, you know, and I was kind of interested in what he what he was doing and he was you know, very, very linear in his thinking. And so there was an element of a a connection there. And once we kind of, once we defined the roles in that, uh, in that process, sometimes, you know, I, you know, I go out for a beer with him or whatnot, or we'd go out to a restaurant, all three of us, and we're talking about whatever. But when it comes down to we switch our golf heads on, if I feel that he's not, he shouldn't be doing something or, he um, he's crossing over into the role of where we've defined where he shouldn't cross over into, I'll tell him. And it's only because the connection we have that we're able to, and the, the, def, the defining of roles that we have is why that works. And it's the same with Emily. So even if Kelvin sees something and he's watched her play, he might then discuss something with me and I could then discuss something with her rather than kind of crossing over and having conflict between the two of them. So it's just this big package, Stu, really, of, mm-hmm. of where are we going to start with? Like, where, where do you want to go? We can't predict, you know, 10, 20 years into the future, but we can kind of chunk it down into smaller segments of where we are going, like, now. And then kind of all sitting down and all talking kind of openly and candidly and and – let, let's kind of plan that journey out and, and one, see where that goes. One of the interesting things for me about, about listening to that, there's actually a lot of interesting things I wanted to ask you about, but one of them particularly that, that jumped out at me. Um, so it's very clear that, um, yeah, Kelvin, Emily's dad, so he his background, uh, he's ex-military, isn't he? Um, yes, he is. He, he's now a minister, if I'm right. Yes, he is, a, yeah. 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 And so obviously... And and also there's six children and she's the eldest, isn't she? Yeah. So yeah. So um, I was quite interested because I think there was a lot of um, I think some really important things that emerged from that. I'm not necessarily sure whether Kelvin is aware of explicitly. He may well be, but I, you know, so there was there's a kind of a, a discipline that's sort of wrapped around uh, Emily's life. So obviously there's the kind of 
uh, military discipline and it's clear that you know when she comes back from golf really doesn't matter how much what she's done everything else she's got jobs to do helping the other little kids and this that and the other but also there's almost like a um what's the word i'm looking for like a spiritual discipline linked to obviously you know his his religious background that that's wrapped around her and it's clear to me that you know when you hear her speak and various other things that you know, she's, yeah, it does her a disservice to say that she's got her head screwed on, but she really has. She really knows who she is and what she's about. And, and that really came out, came out loudly to me. I mean, is that is that an accurate assessment? A hundred percent, yeah. And she, you know, she's very down to earth. She doesn't get wrapped up in all the hype of kind mm. of, you know, what can go on. I mean, she won, she won three, uh, two national championships in like one year, like Scottish and English ladies. And she's won the English girls and, um, one U.S. kids, and yeah. So, if where she is now, she's going to go to Vanderbilt on a um, in 2018, and she had n- you know, numerous colleges after. But she's just very much fixated on like what she's doing on a day to day basis. And there's no, and I think the family help her in that respect because they don't let her. You know, if she came came home from somewhere like kind of like with a big head or boastful or whatnot, they just wouldn't let her, do, just wouldn't let her get away with it because they, they, because their life is so busy they're you know, they have, she, she'll come home. And, and even with Calvin, that there's just things to do. You know, she's, she's the eldest and, you know, she has two, a younger brother who's, um, who's at boarding school and then two sisters after that, that so they're just, she's just Emily to them. You know, she's not, it's not golf. It's you know just being a big sister, and I think that's that's the lovely part of it. And actually, when you see that element of it as well, it's um, it, it definitely helps her, no question. And also with and, regards to them having six, um, and with um, Calvin and and Ruth, you know, who, who's the mum? You know, she's incredible. Like at home and whatnot, keeping some things because you imagine having you know six at home all the time. Um, it could be very, very chaotic, but she's, she is amazing at, you know, certain things of the day need to happen and, and whatnot. It's like a well-oiled machine, but, mm. but with, but the bigger part with Emily's golf, it, they also take that into it because with six, you know, again, we talk about social economics here is that, you know, they're not going to have huge amounts of money to go and play around the world and, and whatnot. So they have to be very diligent with, with what they do and how they plan things out and then how they train around those tournaments. And yeah. Mark Day, who's part of the, I mean, you might know Mark and who's the, oh, yeah. the English girls uh, coach. I mean, he, when I speak to him, you know, he's like, she's almost like a pro now in how she does things. Um, you know, how she prepares for tournaments and, and things like that. And, but again, it, it's, it's come from, the, you know the situations, the social situations, you know, at home and things that we talked about when she was much younger. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about a constraints-led approach, I think people often forget about the the socio-cultural constraints. Massive, yeah, really important. Massively, you know, and that's um, and you're right with that discipline. You know, there is that. You know, if there's time free, she has to take that time to be disciplined to do to do certain things and she's away at um at uh at boarding school now she's at millfield on um um, i don't know what the situation just you know doing golf and doing her a levels um so she you know even there you know when you're at boarding school and you're on your own again i I saw it in america you have to be so switched on and, and use your time so effectively because ultimately, when you're at a boarding school and you have young, uh, young adolescents there, if they don't, con- if their time is not consumed during the day, then they can go off and do what- whatever, and it, you know, get into trouble because that's just the nature of a teenager. But they, so during the day, again, the, everything's kind of laid out, and they you know, this time is for golf. So what are you going to do in this time? This time's for your schoolwork. And this to her is kind of second nature because it's what her life has always been like. And that's why I think she'll go on. Whether she goes on to play professional golf, Stu, I have no idea. But, you know, I know that she will go to college in in the U.S. and she will give it her best and she will get a great degree. 
and whatever kind of comes after that is a bonus, really. Yeah, she got great experience. She'll have a great experience either way. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so um, one thing, the other thing that struck me as well that I thought was really interesting was how when she sort of first broke onto the scene, uh, she was quite young, I think, probably still about about 14, something like that. Yeah. Um, what, what was interesting was a couple of things there. So, well, firstly was you delayed delayed her entry into the into the kind of golfing world by, you know, keeping her out of that space. So she didn't have an official handicap until yes, quite, quite late. I think quite, she was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite late for some, you know, you do have these kids nowadays, you know, like Rory, you know, famously was, you know, winning the under 10 world championships and things like that. So obviously she's quite late into the game, didn't have an official handicap. Um, and then when she did really well, then the county system wanted to kind of embrace her and swallow her up and get her playing for the county team. But your advice was, no, 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 we're staying out of that whole space. And I'm interested, I, I often think that the really successful players tend to come from out with the system, not within the system. Yeah. So I was interested to know kind of what your, th- I mean, we were in that system. So yeah. you know, it's funny <laughs> that we're saying that now, isn't it? But yeah, yeah. Um, but it's interesting that, you know, what your rationale for that was and then also kind of, you know, what you think the sort of pros and cons were. Um, I think the I think the cons first. I think sometimes it's nice. I mean, she's in the England setup now, which is. Yeah. Um, but again, it's 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 changed. And I kind of, you know, you have the relationship with, you know, I think Mark does a fantastic job with that. And I think Robbo is pretty good as well at the um, at the senior level. Um the, the, I think the cons are it's it's kind of nice for for young golfers to get these lev- these summies accolades along you know along the journey to go to squad sessions with other players and and things like that. Um, so I think the, the the social element of of being a young golfer because it can get quite isolated and and whatnot. So that would be you know a, a big con, but from the 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 pro element of you know we we had a team uh, like set up kind of around her and i if i felt that this might sound harsh but if i felt that that the the communication would be right and if i felt that she could go to she would have gone to these things and and people would have kind of you know let her do what she kind of wanted to do and what was kind of laid out then i think it would have been a great thing but at that time i just didn't think it would it was going to happen and it's too many voices and kelvin was very much the same on this where you know she was 13 14 years of age and it's like well just you know just let her play and let us see where you know where she's kind of kind of evolved to rather than you know everybody starting to get you know, put their penneth worth in. And, uh, you know, a lot of this was, you know, I, I definitely, I guided on this, but they were, you know, Emily and, and Kelvin were all in agreement as well. And, you know, we had, we had a discussion of, look, if you, if you play well, you know, we're talking, if we're talking Curtis cup or playing for England or, you know, GB and I, if you choose not to, go down that route if you're still going to play well and you're still going to you know win golf tournaments they're not not going to pick you because you you know your rankings are going to speak for themselves it's just a choice that 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 you you decide to to do things your own way and yeah you know charlie hull you know did it a little bit as well you know in the in the ladies game and and generally you do see and i would agree with you that the ones that seem to kind of crack on are the ones that either know when to come out of the system mm. um, and start to become kind of very self-directing with what they mm. want to do. Um, because if they stay, I, I feel the longer they stay in the system, the harder it is then to get out of the system and start to forge your own kind of pathway because you just have so much support. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I, I definitely saw that as well. And, and it was def- it was something that we were we were working on at the time was, you know, how everything was done for the players. I, I'll never forget actually. Um, the I think one year our under eighteen boys team came. I think it was like fourteenth in the Europeans. Now, you know, for a nation like England to come fourteenth, you know, with the you know we, we had something like I can't remember exactly, but it was about forty forty thousand junior golfers or something. Yeah. And, 
Norway won, and you know Norway's got something like four thousand junior golfers, and you know it's dark half the year. So yeah, exactly. It was like, well, how, how does this happen? And I remember at the time, um, one of the things when the kids players came back, one of the things is it was it really rained. I think it was in Czechoslovakia. It really rained. We couldn't really play in our waterproofs, and it was <laughs> like, well, surely you played in those waterproofs in rain before? And they went, no. Because every time we were in a training environment, you know, and it was raining, we'd go on the range. Yeah. And it was yeah, like, exactly. that was for me, that was like the big smack me in the face moment of it's all just too comfortable. We've got all these nice facilities and stuff like that. You know, if it's absolutely teaming down, we've got to get out there and play in it because that's likely no to be something that we're going to experience. No question. And even and find out, you know, if the process are, well, I put my rain jacket on. And then I take it off to hit my golf shot. You know, some I've seen people do that before if they don't like it, but at least they stay dry and kind of warm. But get, like you said, getting out there in that environment and seeing, you know, seeing what you know what can happen and what needs to happen. But again, I do think yeah. that's down to when you know, I think about, you know, when I was growing up playing, you'd had no choice. You know, there was no practice range that you could go and kind yeah. of hide under. So it was kind of saying, well, if it's raining, you know, what, my choices are: I don't play. Or I do play, and I play in my waterproof or with an umbrella. Yeah, where I think you're right. There's that. There's that easy out now, isn't there? Like it's an easy out to say I'm just going to go in the range and hit golf balls. Yeah, it's it's, it's like. Yeah, I mean, uh, weather is one of golf's big variables, isn't it? And so, when you have an opportunity, when you have an opportunity to to do something with that with that kind of level of variable, then um, it's an opportunity. So just bear with me one second. I'll sure. be back with you in two seconds. Recording a podcast at home. Deliveries come to the door. <laughs> uh, Part of the fun of it. <laughs> it's very real, very real. Yeah. Um, so what, 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 the other thing I was going to ask you about was, um, so uh, uh, you, whilst this journey we, you were on with, with Emily and her family, you, you then, you know, uh, uh, picked up sticks and went over to the States. <laughs> and, but you were still coaching her. And I, I you make reference to the fact that you would often be providing her with what you described as psychological coaching. So I'm kind of interested to know what that looked like. Yeah, I mean, it was a, when you kind of look at that terminology, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not a trained psychologist. It's just more to do with the things that um, that I'd learned from and read from Dr. Dave Collins, of you know, with his PCDEs and, and you know, setting up things to, okay one how do we make things challenging and that's where the constraints came in with their training as well so when you you can say it's it's self-directing psych you know or the ecological dynamic system of psych of psychology where you go you put somebody in an environment um a a tricky environment based on where they need to go and see kind of how they deal with it and then if they don't then we talk and kind of have a little bit of a, a reflection on that and also Really, it's just about knowing her, you know. So if she, you know, I mean, I've known her since she was eight, and I know what kind of type of person she is, and I know that she can get very, um, sometimes too internally focused on things, with you know when she's playing, and she doesn't take in enough information at times um, about the environment. So. I don't know whether you call that psychology or not. I, I, you know, I, th- I think it has an element to it, but I also think it has an element of the environment around her and just knowing what process she needs to go through to, you know, to play at her best, you know, ultimately. Yeah. You know, when she won, I remember I was at Cop Heath with her. Um, this was before I went to the States, and this was at she, at the English girl, English under 15 or English girls. I can't remember right now. Um, and... She played a. Uh, she said, "Oh, you know, she's been three putting and you know just wasting shots." So we kind of just, I just had a look and to see what she was doing. And for me, she again, she wasn't taking in enough information. So we moved her around to ninety degrees, and and she didn't like looking at it from hole to ball. So she just looked ninety degrees, went back to the ball, 
and just ask, start to ask herself you know, certain questions. Is it uphill, downhill, flat? And if it's a mix, you know, where is it? What is it? And, and what is it doing? You know, is this a putt that I want to make or is this a putt that I need to kind of have some speed? And then when she's making her practice swings by the side of the ball, she, you know, she's looking at the hole and kind of just chunking it down. And then for that week, she didn't have a three putt. But if she, so it is part of the, I suppose, a psychological process, but it's not, you know, real deep level psychology. Do you know what no. I mean by that? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not the, you know, kind of psychology from the perspective of like, you know, like counseling. No, not at all. No. <laughs> Emotional type of stuff. It's more the, um, well, I suppose it's, it's, it's skill isn't it it's what we what you're talking about in terms of skill because it's it's about managing your um or you know uh, it's we're all about motor learning and yep. what you're doing is utilizing or f- helping her to find ways for her to be able to do the kind of under, understand what she's both seeing sensing perceiving and then turning that into action so it's the very yeah. definition of perception perception action coupling isn't it yeah no question and it, you know we're and knowing her you know when for her to kind of go through that process and take in um take in a lot of that information i then I'm, i know how she is and when she's consumed with information she's much better at accessing the skills that she has. So it, it is absolutely perception action coupling, you know, in its, yeah. um, and it's just putting that into, into her routine and making sure that, <clears throat> you know, that that filters in, you know, I also know that with her because I've known her for so long, she tends to get a little bit because of how linear she is. She can sometimes get a little bit guidey, you know, with what she does on the, um, you know, in tournament play and that's with everything. So just, mm-hmm take just you know dialing down the intensity sometimes and just kind of freeing things up but again that's just from me like knowing her since she was you know since she was so young um you just know the individual and know things that kind of work for her and for me i don't i don't see those things need to ever change you know people say yeah well you need to change can can constantly keep evolving in in these things i'm like well why because if she's if she's shown like in her processes that these she's able to do these things and access her skill, she just needs to keep doing them. Yeah. And and that's the bit I think where for me, this is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about, um, you know, bordering on evangelical, I suppose, bordering on the, uh, the ecological approach because it changes, I think the way uh, as a coach, you view your role, so for me, um, what you're talked about there, I mean, that that's for me exactly how coaching should be. You know, you're assen- essentially helping the player or the athlete make sense of the various um, sources of information that are coming at them. And for a lot of, for a lot of kids, the, it's overwhelming. There's, there's far too much taking place. So what you're doing is you're either helping to filter some of the noise out so that they can just focus on the right thing or uh you're kind of dialing up and almost like putting a laser focus on the really important areas that are going to help them with performance at that point which for me is like fundamentally what learning is all about yeah definitely and I think a lot of people yeah. miss that they think it's all about just uh you know or basically if we can improve a technique then that will solve the problem yeah and and you know we you know when we set and they talk about technique and, and whatnot and you know the studies will say well we d- we'll never repeat the same thing twice you know, when we're, mm. when we're actually doing a, you know, a sport or even something like golf, you know, so even when we're on the range, you know, we're thinking that I can stand there hitting seven irons, but every seven iron they might hit, there may be different motors firing at different times. And that, and, you know, and to actually create a similar result or a slightly different result, but that's actually okay. And I think we're obsessed yeah. with this, you know, level of, oh, you need to groove in this, this motor pattern or you know i need to get my reps in and stuff like that and i'm like well when do you ever do that You're like really <laughs> you know, yeah absolutely right. yeah, that's, that's yeah. really the thing about it yeah 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 and if we go so, back slightly to um what i was saying about you know with kelvin and um, with the parent stuff i mean that's really Stu, why i wrote this book um gifted junior is because I remember one of the first times where I did a, um, I did a, 
a, like a parents' evening, I guess. And I was talking about certain things at that time. And I remember kind of looking into the, it was probably about 25 parents in this room. And I was looking at them going, this is not going well at all. You know, like very kind of shut down, body language wasn't good. And I was thinking, okay, is it the, the, the content, the delivery? You know, what was it? And then as it kind of went on, I did another one. It was the same, different people, but the same. And I started then to kind of ask somebody that I knew. And they were like, well, it, it, it felt like, you were telling me how to parent. And that was a kind of a real, and I, you know, I'm a parent myself. And it was a real eye opener for me as saying, well, okay, I want to write a book about, you know, how to help parents or the kind of the ups and downs of, of junior development. I have to write it so they can make up their own minds about things and they can take out of it what they want to take out of it. And that's why I wrote a story versus a, a kind of a how to, you know, type of, a type of book and you know as that kind of came came about it was that also led into the role side of things so de- defining roles you know within the team that you have to know that and I'll openly say this when I have meetings with parents and their players I'm never ever going to tell you you know how to parent your son or daughter you know what they should be doing at home and and stuff like that. That's that's your role as a parent and how you want to bring them up. But when it comes to their golf and their performance, if if you all agree that this is where that person wants to go, then within that environment, that's when I'm going to coach and I'm sometimes I'm going to I am going to say things to you which are which are connected to her golf. Or, That's or, a really important point, I think, because I think um, I think a lot. I've detected anyway that a lot of coaches really struggle with parental engagement. So I think um, I think the book's very timely um, in the sense that I think I've seen uh, and talent developers for that reason. I was I was at a I was doing a uh, coach development session at the weekend, and I, uh, I before I got in there, there was a session going on with parents and. The people at the front of the room who were representatives of the, the governing body, um, one of them said, um, we're, we're trying to create a high performance environment for your children and we need you to be high performance parents. And there was this audible gasp in the room. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, God. I really don't know if that's what I would have said in that scenario because it goes back to that point you make around almost telling them how to parent and 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 like you say that's very much you know up to them I think you just got to make them more aware of certain things that have well certain things have these consequences other ways have these consequences and yeah, just absolutely. let people kind of make their own choice absolutely and I think and then that comes with and you know I've seen for me I think parents get a really bad reputation you know in in and in junior sport and some very much just you know you've seen uh, you know i've at certain events i've been to it's it's absolutely shocking but there are some really good ones as well you know and that's and i think where i'm not i'm never about and i did change my tune on this as well and i'll openly say it i always used to think well maybe just keep them away and i was like well no you know they're so vital to the cog you know they're you know because if you get them on board, they're so powerful in, in the message that they will say and how they'll talk to their son or daughter. And I can't remember, I read a couple of papers on on this whole thing and um, it was really a case of, well, you can have the, the most amazing coaching session that you've ever done and that player can walk away, whether it's soccer, rugby, hockey, which I know you're, um, you love and you kind of coach and, and play – but they, if they get in the car, okay, and they're getting picked up and they're getting taken home, and their mum or their dad say something derogatory or something negative about what's happened or or what not, everything you've done is flattened, absolutely flattened. So this is where, when you see the influence or the you know the percentage influence that you can have on a on a developing a, a young athlete, and this is why it's so difficult and why so few kind of keep you know keep going is that the parent has way more than you do as a coach so so they have to be involved 
Like they have, they, there's, there's no two ways about it. They will watch their son or daughter, and I'll talk golf now, play more than you will because they, they generally take them there. Mm. So if you kind of strike up this roles and this, this element of connection and this, you know, this, this team environment, you can have really, really long lasting um, developmental steps, you know, as, as they kind of move through life. I don't know what you. They I don't know what think, your views on that are, but um, you no, know, that, entirely, that. entirely agree, entirely agree. And I've I've heard it. You know, worked in a number of different talent systems, and genuinely, you know, you I've heard people literally say, you know, this job would be fine if it wasn't for the parents. And I've said things. You know, I've heard them. You know, want to keep parents out of the out of the environment and all these sorts of things. And for me, I, I fundamentally think that's that's just a flaw. I mean, you're you're just missing out or you're abdicating an area of real responsibility as a coach because I've often said that um, part of the task of being a coach a talent coach particularly is to um, is to try and help manage all of the various inputs that are coming in on the player and parental input is absolutely huge and those parents can either reinforce and amplify the message or not and more often than not if a parent doesn't it's not because they're maliciously trying to get in the way of that player's development it's because they're emotionally invested in that young person's you know um, journey and what seems an instinctive thing to do that makes lots of sense often is completely the opposite of what they should do but they just don't know any better and that's the but that's one of the, the things i tried to get across in in the book as well of you know, no matter what you've got, always got to look and say that parent doesn't want, you know, they want their son or daughter to, to succeed. You know, they mm. they're doing it out of you know love and 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 wanting to to help them get to where they want to get to. You know, so mm. well, you know, not like coaches. You know, not every parent has the answers to this. You know, and yeah. and, and never will. You know, some you know in there, there's an element of vulnerability to. Um, to the the main father character in the book to because he didn't really know and i've seen this but he felt that he was had to portray this kind of role and yeah. and and again i, I see this a, you know a huge amount in you know in a lot of sports that i've kind of been around in yeah it's um and, and it's one of those things, it's one of the reasons I, you know, and, you know, we're obviously talking from the same hymn sheet, because it's one of the reasons I, I started writing the blog, you know, because partially I wanted to document my own my own coaching journey, but also I wanted to be able to share with people who were going through similar experiences working with, you know, young people who were on a talent development journey. And, and interestingly enough, actually, some of the stuff I've been sharing more recently about my own experiences with my own child and conversations with my wife and things like that, yeah. you know, that's actually been some of the, the, mo- the most popular um uh, posts that i've written because i think there's a lot of people out there kind of you know trying to navigate this stuff themselves and and, and it clearly resonates with them yeah i mean and i think that's absolutely vital i think you do a fantastic job you know with with those i know i love reading your blogs and and whatnot and it's you know very very um even eye-opening to me you know some of the things because you know i like hearing things from like different sports as well mm. um and you know it's it's that if we're looking at that you know that trust element and that connection element and and things like that and just with the with the student at the center you know i'll go back to what i said at the start of this show of watch them play because the reason behind that with watching them play the best relationships i've had with parents is walking the fairways with them so yeah. actually <clears throat> students or play you know son or daughter is playing well, you know, you, you have to walk down the sides or, you know, stay out of the way. So what are you going to do? You're just going to chat. You know, you're just going to mm-hmm. chat about all sorts of things. And that's how mm-hmm. we build, you know, you can build these relationships and start to, you know, even educate, you know, passively educate. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I remember vividly walking down the fairway once, down the side of one hole, and the players kind of pushed when, you know, down the right into this, like, land in the bushes and, you know, the father, because he wants his son to do well, like jumps up in the air, like arms flapping around and whatnot. And I'm like, but he didn't mean to do that. You know, it's not like he's trying to hit it in that bush. And also your the actions that you're showing right now, he's going to feel that. You know, he will see that. So let's just, you know, let's just kind of be a little bit more neutral to the whole thing. And he, yeah. and because, you know, 
And I said it in a kind of a funny way, but but it really helped him. You know, it really helped him actually enjoy watching his son or his son play more. And it actually helped him have a better relationship with his with his son as well, because he, you know, they don't really talk too much about the micro elements of performance. It's much more about Oh, you know, how was it out there today? You know, what what did you feel? And it wasn't really kind of like certain elements. He just let, he, there were certain elements of questions that would try and help the player kind of reflect on their own. And if the student, if the, for him, if his son didn't want him to, to say anything, he would know because if he was very quiet and just wanted to be kind of quiet by himself, then he'd just start talking about where they want to go to dinner or, you know, whatever it might be. So yeah. that's the, the, those are the, that's what I'm saying. Those are the good parents that I've kind of had had time to spend as well. That are also willing to um, have a growth mindset themselves, because yeah, not everybody knows what's great and what's not. Absolutely. And the thing about that whole growth mindset thing, as Carol Dweck's talking about at the moment, is it's it's not something that you you have. You know, in any given moment, you can have a fixed mindset given a certain certain set of circumstances. But going back to what you were doing, what you were helping Emily with was trying to help her manage different uh scenarios and it's the same with the parents you know there's different things that are going to hit them emotionally at various times and there's ways that they can respond to that and it's about becoming self-aware enough to understand the different responses that are available to them yeah absolutely and i love that stuff that the uh the carol dweck was talking about with that fixed and kind of growth because if we're always growth mm. then we can also other stuff can be influenced the good stuff that we do mm. Mm. you know so so sometimes you have to be, you know, and we're talking like an elite level. Sometimes you have to be a little bit kind of stubborn to say, well, no, I, you know, I feel that this is really good for me and I can show you evidence to why that would, why that would be. And that to me is not whether you can call that fixed mindset or not, but they're very fixed on their views of what, what's good for them. Yeah. 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 And there's that ebb and flow of things again, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, we're coming up close on time, and you know, can you believe we're you know we're fifty minutes into the conversation? But um, I think this could go on for a couple on... of days, to be honest. <laughs> Maybe over a few De- years and whatnot. <laughs> we'll probably have to do. We'll definitely have to do a part two. I would have thought. Um, <laughs> but um, where can people find you in the in the worldwide interwebs and everything else? And if they want to find out, if they want to get hold of the book, um, where can they get hold of that? So if they just type in Stuart Morgan. Uh, so it's uh, Stuart, it's got Stuart M coaching and that's, um, uh, Twitter. I think, I think that's my handle. I don't really kind of pay attention to my own handle, to be honest. Let me just double check that. Um, and I'm on Facebook. Uh, they can just contact me direct if they have any questions and say to Stuart, that's S T U A R T at Stuart Morgan golf.com. Right. Uh, and my Twitter handle is Stuart M Coaching, and that's on that's on Twitter. And if they want to buy the book, it's on Amazon as a Kindle download, and um, also as a hard copy. I've tried my hardest to try and figure out how to get it onto um, the iBooks, but I can't seem to do that right now. So it is it is work in progress, um, and also trying to figure out how to get the audio book done, but. Um, but they can get the Kindle version and the hard copy off Amazon all over the world. Brilliant. Well, that's uh, that's awesome. Um, you've done better than I have. I've been been promising to write a book for the last two years and haven't quite got haven't got there yet. But um, I, I found a system to do list. it, though, Stu. I basically said to myself, no matter what, I'm going to do something every day. So even yeah. if I didn't want to do, you know, I didn't want to do it, I would start. And even if it's a sentence. And then all of a sudden, the sentence turns into a paragraph, and and so on and so forth. But as long as it's every day, you kind of I just did a little bit, and then all of a sudden, it got to a point where you know it it was done, and that's that that just worked for me at that time. It's got to be the way I think. I just, <laughs> it's like anything; it's the intention action gap. Yeah. <laughs> I need a coach. <laughs> maybe your, maybe your blogs turn into just a, uh, an organic book. 
well maybe that's right maybe that's the that's the thing isn't it it's out there and uh yeah maybe in time that's what it'll be what it will become absolutely Listen, um, i'm enormously grateful for you taking the time to uh to speak to me and to, to share your experiences with the audiences like i said i think i think there's definitely going to be a part two coming up further in the maybe share some of your experiences of working in in the european system and and uh and what you've what you've learned from that as well that might be yeah, quite interesting. Be great and thanks so much All for right. having me on it's always great to uh, talk to like-minded individuals and you know, you keep trying to get the word out of you know improved application on these things, and uh, I just can't thank you enough for those things. Great stuff. Thanks, Stuart. Thank Appreciate you, Stu. Appreciate it.